start with is if each of you would give us um, two minutes on your context of your industry, your job, your life, just a quick five sentence overview, <laughs> two minutes, so that they have a sense of where your comments are coming from as we go through the night. Start with you, Troy. All right. Um, first of all, it's great to be here. And uh, as all artists say, I'm glad y'all came out. And uh, after listening to our introductions, we both like ourselves better than we did before, I think it's fair to say. Um, so I'm, um, you know, I'm a believer. Um, I'm, a, um, I'm a husband to Sylvia. I'm a uh, dad to Kelly and Joshua. I'm a uh, peepaw to our two grandsons, Aiden and Luke. Um, I'm a brother to my brother, Tim. Uh, our parents uh, are both deceased, but great parents with a great uh, upbringing. And uh, I do also happen to be uh, in the music business and, and have a, uh, what I would probably consider the, uh, the best job in the entertainment business. I'm really uh, blessed to do it in Nashville and I'm uh, blessed to do it for Sony, and I am uh, extremely blessed to get to work with the, the talented songwriters that I get to work with. So is that what context means? Great. Okay. All right. How about you, Bill? Y'all should be in the back when the first guy being announced his career is Taylor Swift. and <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just went on and on, and I turned around to Tom Douglas and said, how is she going to introduce me? I'm a plumber and an <laughs> air conditioning guy. And how is she going to make this sound uh, comparable? But um, <laughs> I'm a very fortunate man, indeed, to be in the spot that I'm in. And my grandfather started our company. And um, the I, I, too, you know, my, my life is primarily motivated and driven by my relationship with Jesus, um, my family, my beautiful wife, Maria, and children and grandchildren. I'm BB. Um, are the most important thing in my life, but I do uh, have this great privilege of having, uh, being at the head of a company that has a thousand employees that are mostly uh, plumbers and pipe fitters and welders and blue collar workers and they're, uh, you know, they're awesome people, and it's a, uh, yeah, it's a great privilege to be able to do that. So why don't you all get us going tonight by answering the very easy and uh, won't make you sweat question about what kind of things do you struggle with as your false idols? So we <laughs> <laughs> Let's just start them off with an easy wing, and I'll... <laughs> To be fair, I'll say that one of my false idols is um, seeking words of affirmation. So things like the speaker getting sick is very hard for me because, of course, I want a successful evening um, that's been planned tonight. Um, so what kinds of things um, do you really struggle with that aren't bad in and of themselves, but you can sometimes put ahead of your relationship with God? Well, fortunately, I don't have any. And so I'm... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I know a lot of people that do. As I've, as I've, as I've gotten to know Bill, I could share his, but I, uh, um, which would be far more comfortable for me. But um, uh, I think um, people pleasing is certainly. Um, I have like seasonal idols, and then I have like idols in residence, you know. And um, I think um, I think people pleasing is uh, is. Uh, more of a uh, idol in residence for me too. Um, I, um, you know, as as I thought about tonight, I thought um, you guys are going to participate in my idol worship of people pleasing. Um, no matter how you react, uh, when you laugh, as you have been kind enough to do, that just affirms the fact that I have the ability to please people. And then if you don't laugh hard enough, I go home going, "What am I going to do to make them happy with me?" And so um, I make a, a joke about it, but it's, uh, it's, it's really real when you're preoccupied 
I guess is the best way to put it, preoccupied with the idea of pleasing people. I do have the ability to justify it, uh, as I can with pretty much anything I want to do, and I, I justify it by saying, well, what, who wouldn't want to be liked? I mean, the opposite is, are there people that want to be disliked? Um, and so I kind of justify it that way, but that's not, you know, that's really not a real um, honest response. The second idol that's more seasonal um, directly has to do with my work, and that's um, we're, we're a market leader. And, um, and our company, Sony, has been a market leader long before I ever, um, uh, before I was born, and, and, uh, and certainly before I went there. And so um, the idea of carrying on that, that role uh, can preoccupy uh, me to the point that I wake up and it's the first thought on my mind and uh, on my mind most of the day and then maybe the last thing I think about before I fall, to sleep, fall asleep. So I think that qualifies as an idol. Um, I also justify it, uh, and I like to use the Bible to justify things that I'm wrong about. And so I, <laughs> I, um, I say, you know, Christ is clear. Uh, the whole of Scripture is clear that uh, we're to be good stewards of that which has been entrusted to us. And I'm just, I'm not really preoccupied with, with being a market leader. I'm just trying to be a good steward, Lord. I mean, and I can, that one I can actually really make work for me pretty good. <laughs> but uh, um, and, but it's, it's, it's real uh, because when I really drill down on what that is, it's not, it is, there is an element of it that does relate to stewardship. But when I really drill it down, it has to do with my reputation, uh, which would be the, the real idol underneath uh, that. And, and it's that, that uh, I don't want to be the guy that uh, runs the ship aground. You know, I don't want to be the guy that gets the, the car off in the ditch. So how's that? You know, uh, the, the, the in, that's awesome. Okay. The interesting thing about idols is that... Um, Neither of those are, are we're wired uh, for um, God's approval, yet when we take it out of context, seeking man's approval is when it gets, we're wired to work with excellence and to try to, you know, steward your company well, but it's when taken out of context or That's when true. the important thing becomes um, not the most important. What about you? What do you struggle with? I'd prefer it if you'd top mine. <laughs> if you don't mind. I'm trying to make you look good if <laughs> I can. Do. It'll make me happy and please people. You do that. Uh, my wife could answer this question. Um, uh, I, I think, it, I, I suppose it's an idol, certainly a, a weakness and a sin. That's the thing I struggle with, which is I'm a person who uh, is in control of things, and I like to be in control of things. And I can. And interestingly, the more you advance in your career, the more capable you become of controlling circumstances and the more authority you have to control circumstances. And you become used to it. And um, that causes us to forget who is in control, even though we get up every day and think, even though I get up every day and, and say, you know what, God's in control of all of these things in my life, but I don't um, act like he's in control of them. I act like if I do everything just right, uh, I'll be able to manipulate those circumstances to make them work out. Um, <clears throat> it's a terrible way to live if you submit to it because uh, it you do lose sight of the fact that there are it, it 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 eradicates all things work for good for those who love the Lord and call according it eradicates that because things that you don't like and you try to change um, because you don't trust that they might be working for good um, it eradicates uh, it eradicates the really simply trusting at all and you know, the Lord has known that in my life. He's very good to me. And he um, lovingly creates circumstances that 
I cannot fix so that I am forced to deal with my own um, issue of control. You referred to a tragedy in my life, and my wife was killed in an accident, and I had uh, four little kids and a business to run, and um, it was out of my control. And suddenly I was faced with no way to fix it. And a terrible one thing after another. My daughter, you know, tried to commit suicide after that. My business was on the verge of collapse. And I, who had lived my life kind of controlling everything and making it work out just the way I thought it would work out, was suddenly kind of faced with the reality that none of it was going to work out and maybe all of it was going to disappear. And where was I going to be left in trusting God with that. And it was one of the most wonderful, transformative, terrible, painful periods of my life. But it, uh, it was really for the first time in my life that I was able to go, you know what, Lord, you can have all of this and you can work to solve it. And he has so magnificently for me in my life and such in a, such a redeeming way. But my personality still likes to control. I keep going back to the same spot. So he, he works really hard to fix me, but it's, I'm, I'm going in the other direction a lot. Um, this morning, uh, the, the, a colleague that works with me at the National Institute for Faith and Work this morning, I uh, woke up and sent him a text message that said, I'm a little bit of a control freak, so setting up this event was probably stressful for him. And I said, uh, something will go wrong tonight, but it will be okay. We're not going to measure ourselves on worldly things. And I was like, <laughs> darn it. <laughs> Shouldn't have sent that message. Um, anyway, uh, so I like control too. Um, tell us, Troy, um, let's talk about the music industry for a little bit. Talk to me um, about some of the struggles um, in country music, some of the messaging in country music, some of the messaging around um, work. Um, That's great. I, I um, was thinking as I was listening to everybody talk, um, I feel like these folks aren't getting their money's worth over here. So, uh, <laughs> um, um, and you're seeing that thing right here. Like, uh, but... Um, um, uh, Missy had asked me at one point, um, what's the messaging, if you will, generally speaking, okay, generally speaking, in country music, what's the messaging in the lyrics as it relates to work? And uh, I never really given much thought to it until she said it, and I instantly, um, you know, you can sort of sum it up with three songs that um, a lot of you are going to know. Um, Take this job and shove it. Um, Working man's blues, and a Keith Whitley song, and an Earl Thomas Conley song too, by the same title. It's finally Friday. I'm free again. Got my motor running for a wild weekend. Um, that sort of sums it up, you know. It's a uh, the, but I think what's to be fair to songwriters, uh, and about, uh, please remember, I'm generalizing. And this isn't being recorded or anything, is it? It might be. Okay. I'm generalizing. He's but generalizing. Yes, I am generalizing. Um, but uh, think about it. Uh, for a songwriter, songwriters, um, we, sometimes we kind of refer to them as prophets. And, and there's, there's, there are some that certainly do look out ahead of, ahead of the culture a bit and sort of uh, almost give us a, a little peek into something that's about to happen or something that's occurring or a movement that they feel because artists, whether they are um, singers or painters or sculptors or songwriters, artists are hypersensitive to life and they're hypersensitive to their surroundings. So they feel things much like a mother feels uh, when her child is sick, you know, when the dad's going, they're fine and, and the mom feels something and they're hypersensitive to their children's well-being. Songwriters, in this case, are similar. Uh, so sometimes they write things that they're feeling that are coming. But they also are reporters. 
You know, they, they sort of report on the culture that we live in. And for country music, you know, although it's in, in every state, people buy country music, and they're, it's hard to believe, but there are as many rednecks in upstate New York as there are in Nashville. Uh, right, Scott? Um, but but um, when they're reporting, they are uh, many times reporting on the things that their experience has been and the people that they know's experience has been. So think about it. We live in a culture, whether you're watching TV or, what, or you're at the movies or you're doing these surveys that say everybody hates their job, um, the culture screams at us, work bad, weekend good. It really does. I mean, finally Friday is the perfect picture of it. And so um, no wonder people think you know, are unhappy with their jobs. No wonder people have trouble understanding uh, the right view, if you will, of really good work. Like when God you know, created everything, when he was finished, what did he say? It was good. He looked at it, he said it was good. And, and, and when we mow the yard right, you know, to get it down to base ideas, we mow the yard and we step back and look at it, what do we say? And it looks good and we feel good about the work we've done. But when it comes to the workplace and what we call you know, our vocation, many times it's what we have to do to pay for the things that we want to do that are more fun. And so writers report on that and give songs to the public that allow the public then to relate to the lyrics. If they talk about, I went in, I woke up late, my truck wouldn't start, I got in and the boss was on my back, I sweated all day. Uh, I, I got back in, you know, back home, and my wife won't talk to me, and my dog won't even, you know, snuggle up to me. And <laughs> and I can't wait for Friday. Does that make sense to everybody? Of course it does, right? But it's a it's a really um, I think it's not only an unbiblical view of what work should be and how we should see our work, but it's just not a healthy one. If you, if you follow that, you wind up with 80% of the population saying, I hate my work. So did I answer the question? So what's your, what's your role as the head of Sony mm -hmm. and stewarding Sony, mm -hmm. yet seeing this message um, that is, is broken about work? Yeah. What's your role and what kind of songwriters have you encountered that um, defy that message? That's a great question. It's hard, um, it's hard in my role to um, point writers toward what, you know, what they should say. Um, artists are artists, and uh, they create art that, that uh, they are comfortable putting out there, and if the people like it, it's really great. Um, I have, I have every kind of, I have every make and model <laughs> of songwriter, and, um, and I love them. And uh, they they uh, they bring me much joy, uh, but uh, of course there are those who are a little more particular about the messaging that they put out there. Uh, Tom Douglas, that you guys will hear uh, later, the headliner, Bill and I call him, um, uh, the one that drew the crowd. Um, we. Uh, Tom is a writer who is, uh, whether he articulates this to you or not, just trust me, it's true. Tom writes songs that are redemptive in nature. There's a, there's a redemptive element to the songs that Tom writes. Now, he doesn't believe that all songs have to be that way, that everybody writes, and nor, nor, nor do I hold to that. Uh, but in, from Tom's perspective, he likes to have a, a redemptive nature in the songs that he writes. Other writers that write for us really want to write songs that provide sort of an escape, if you will, from the trap that people do find themselves in, uh, in a job that they don't like or, or working with people they don't like. So it's all over the board. I think my, your, your question's a hard one as it relates to my role. I, I, uh, and this is probably just a justification for me as well, but my job is first and foremost to love them. And uh, creative people, more than the average Joe, more than Bill or I, uh, they really do need to feel that they are loved and that what they do, all of, this applies to all of us, is appreciated. And so my first job is to love them, to come alongside them. You know, I love the, 
I think the word for Holy Spirit is paraclete that we use. And if, is that right, Scott? Am I close to saying that paraclete is the word that refers to the Holy Spirit? It's a picture of coming alongside someone. And I, and I've, I see myself as, as a form of a paraclete, someone who's called to come alongside them and to encourage them and to love them. I hope yeah. I avoided answering that. I'm going to leave you on the hot seat a little more than I'm coming over to you, Bill. But, right. Troy, um, you talked to me one day in your office. We talked about um, uh, people as transactions versus people in relationships. And you talked about how in your role there is the opportunity to exploit the I'll do anything to make it artist. Yeah. Um, will you talk a little bit about that and how you work through that? I don't remember what I said that day, so I hope I, I, hope I keep it straight. But uh, certainly, you either, you know, we either look at people as, um, as you said, sort of transactions or uh, a method or a means for us to, for me to get what I want. Or we look at them as people that we're there to actually serve. Um, and that as we serve them, we trust that, that we too will be blessed from their very presence in our lives. My, my life, is, as I said, has been richly blessed by these wonderfully crazy songwriters that have thoughts that I could never imagine, and they're just woven in and out of my life for the last 31 years of my life and taking me places I could have never, ever experienced. But the last way I could look at them is like just transactional um, we're called to serve them. We're, we're, I, I tweeted a quote yesterday, but it was late last night, and I don't remember who said it or exactly what the quote was, but the essence of it was, the essence of it uh, was, um, all good work is work that is at the service of others. And that applies to CEOs and owners of wonderfully successful companies. But we think it applies to preachers, and, and, and nurses and doctors only. And it, it simply doesn't. How'd I do on that one? That was good. Okay, I'll good. give you an A plus on Please that. Please do. Um, I, I'll speak to even something great. he said that keep you from having to think up a new question. <laughs> um, that whole thing about it's finally Friday uh, and how our culture and certainly how most of the culture of the people that I work with um, generally feel about their work. That's, I'm a little bit different than you in that I, I can do something about that. And I can, and, it, and that's really my primary job. We have a little orientation every month for new employees that are come in. So in, in my industry uh, where we have a lot of you know, we have a lot of high-skilled, high-paid workers from all the way from, you know, the top to three-fourths of the way down or four-fifths of the way down the pay scale. And then we have a group in the construction industry, you have a whole group of people who have no skill and no education, and they come to Lee Company maybe for the first time, uh, you know, except for working at McDonald's, that they maybe come there for the first time. So they might start at $11 an hour as an unskilled, uneducated worker. And uh, there's a little struggle there for me just because it's, it's interesting to really care about your employees and love your people and have folks working on a working wage of $24,000 a year, which you know they can barely survive on, and yet the market dictates a wage scales to, in order for a company to be competitive. That's a little bit separate issue in itself, but at the same time, we, are, we have the great privilege of introducing people into a career that they actually can develop into a, a, you know, a lifelong career and, and make a good living out of it. But in this orientation meeting every month are all the people that are coming to lead company for the first time, and there might be 10 or 15 or 20 a month because we have, there's a lot of turnover in that lower 5% of the workforce. But I tell them when I walk in, my primary, and I try to speak to every orientation group, just walk in there for five minutes and say, hey, I'm Bill Lee, and um, welcome to lead company. I'm glad you chose it. And my primary job is to create an environment where you can thrive personally 
and professionally. Um, we're going to do everything we can for you to love your job. I'm, I'm grateful that you're here. We need you to be here. And what I really want is for you to retire at this company. And these people are 22 and have, and they're there, and they, they're thinking it's finally Friday. That's, that's what they're thinking they're coming to. And you know what? I wish Lee Company were perfect and that none of them experienced, you know, a bad experience at work. And, and we're not perfect at that. But I get the privilege of creating an environment where they don't feel that way. And it's hard to do for that environment of that kind of, that kind of worker. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a privilege. It's the goal. And then the other thing that goes along with that is I believe that a bunch of the people that walk through the door of Lee Company are not darkening the door of a church. They're not going to. And uh, they might, by darkening the door of Lee Company, they might have an encounter with the Spirit of God without ever being told about God in the workplace, but they might have an encounter with the Spirit of God that they would have no other way in their life. And I, I really believe that. And we have a chaplain in our company, and um, when he came to work there, I said to Jason, who's an awesome guy, he's just totally relates to these folks and uh, but I said, Jason, you need to understand your goal is not to get people saved. That's not why you're here. Your goal is simply to love those employees, whether they're a Christian or an atheist or a Muslim or whether they're living with their third girlfriend and have three child support payments, which a lot of them do, and they're coming into your office because life is not working out very well for them, your goal is to love them and not to get them saved. The Lord will save them. And he and I have the greatest relationship. But I, I really do think that people's lives are changed by being in contact with and being in just an environment, like you talked about, everybody wanting to be loved, of being loved. And then, by the way, they figure it out. They connect the dots. They, uh, well, they connect the dots. So one thing I'd love for you to share, um, I learned um, this about Bill Lee at a conference, and then I actually called him after I learned this to say, can I come talk to you, thinking about, hmm, maybe he should sit on this couch tonight. And I learned that Bill um, actually hires people that are traditionally considered unemployable because maybe they have a felon record, and he wants to make sure you know that they are never employed in the residential business. So they would never be in your homes if you call Lee Company, get your heater fixed. Thank you for that but, clarification. <laughs> but um, I, was, I first noticed um, Bill Lee by hearing him talk about his program to hire people coming out of prison, to give them a chance to understand the dignity of work. And will you talk a little bit about that? Uh, we do uh, we do make an effort to um, because we're a really unique employer in that we actually those folks can be very beneficial to us. I mean, they're they they are unskilled. They are this. They are that, and they will fit right into a certain segment of our business. And uh, many of them are actually really, really grateful to have the privilege to work because they can't get jobs any other way. Um, and I was actually thinking, I wasn't going to necessarily share this, but about having people recognize that there's something greater than uh, the kind of it's finally Friday job. There's one of these men that I met through the prison program that I actually kind of befriended and became a mentor to. And it's a really interesting relationship for him now that we've actually kind of become friends. And we just go have dinner and we might go work out or we, we've become friends over the years. And he really is one of my good friends. And it's, uh, you know, he doesn't tell anybody that he works with that we our friends, or that we, it's too weird for him. He's like, they wouldn't, they wouldn't believe that. 
<laughs> they, wouldn't, they wouldn't believe that we're like out to dinner. And, but one of the reasons that has been so meaningful for me is because I've watched this guy um, feel good about himself and feel good about his work and feel and have a, uh, you know, suddenly want to become more educated and want to maybe move into a different role in the company and want to, and part of it's because I'm encouraging him in that, but, you know, people can completely transform because of their work. And to see a guy that was in prison and a total loser in the way he was living his life, to, uh, to see him move to the, just to the place that he is today and turning his life around is uh, awesome. And so for that reason, yeah, we work with uh, organizations that try to place uh, people that otherwise might have a really hard time getting a job. One thing I know about your industry is there's a lot of cranes in downtown Nashville right now, and those cranes will eventually go back down. And so there's a lot of cyclicality to your workforce. And how do you, as someone who tries to, to steward your human resources in a loving way, how do you um, approach, think about, and deal with the cyclicality that comes with your industry? Yeah, that's one of the most difficult things we face. I see Stuart Price out there somewhere, and he runs our construction group. And um, I kind of walk into his office every now and then as we're hiring up and hiring up and say, you know, this is, you know, is going to end at some point. And these cranes and these buildings, and, um, and when it does, we, we either need to be, have been really smart so that we don't have to lay off 200 people. It's one of the hardest things about our industry I laid off 400 workers in 14 months one year. This was in that little grouping of disastrous things in my life that occurred within a three-year three period of time. And um, at one of our offices in Birmingham that we closed the whole office down, I chose to tell each person face-to-face, -face, uh, call them into the office and sit across from them and tell them I was really sorry we're going to close the office and they're going to lose their job. How many was that? Well, there were 400, but the face-to-face -face meetings occurred. There were about 15 in that office. And we, you know, you call in 50 people and stand up before them in our main office and just say, I'm sorry, but today's your last day. And, they, and these are people that have been there for 20 years, some of them, or 10 I mean, loyal people. And it wasn't because they had done anything wrong. And sometimes just because work slows down, and it's a, in our industry, it's a really um, difficult thing to go with the swings of the economy. And yet, um, our company wouldn't have survived if we hadn't done that. And, you know, that was, what, 13 years ago, and we hired a lot of those people back, and, you know, we wouldn't have survived. And remembering and knowing when you're sitting across the chair from that that lady who's crying because you've just ruined her life, knowing that there are four more that are going to continue to work because you're making the right decision. And it, it there's nothing easy about that and there's nothing there's nothing good about it and there's nothing except that God gives you the grace and the wisdom and the you know, you do what you can to be loving and graceful through that, through that kind of situation. So there's not a good answer to that other than it happens, it's tough, and it's a struggle as a believer to put people through hardship. Um, yeah. Troy, will you talk about working with your musicians and the applause? We've talked a bit about that. Oh, yeah. Um, a... Uh, a um an artist that uh, was with our company a long time ago who, uh, who is now deceased and has been for many years. Don't try to guess who it is or nothing. Um, uh, he said one time, um, during my heyday, I had, it was a little bit Solomon-like. Solomon he said, I had all the girls I wanted to be with, I had all the booze I wanted to drink, all the pills that I wanted to take, but nothing was as addictive as two hands coming together to 
clap for me or to applaud me. And I think um, that's not simply uh, isolated or particular to performers or, or artists. I think we, uh, if most of the people in this room were honest, and I'm sure you're honest people, you would admit that um, being, you know, being noticed, being appreciated, being lifted up, being having your name shouted out from the stage of some event, uh, being recognized for your work uh, and appreciated for it, it kind of gives us a, you know, a high. There's an endorphin deal or something that kicks in there and, and makes us feel good. And uh, certainly the entertainment business, uh, we, we actually are built to, to set that up. I mean, we, we, we built an industry, the entertainment industry period, whether it's movies or whatever, it's, it's sort of built to raise people up gifted people, but to raise them up, and what do we do when we raise them up? We applaud them. Um, that applause, as wonderful as it is, and as much as we all like it, it can actually turn into a harmful addiction. So once again, taking things that might otherwise be good things and, and them, you know, becoming bad. It's interesting, um, bringing Catherine into town today, before she got the flu, we stopped by and met with Troy, and we were coming down Music Row. kind of wish y'all to skip that now. <laughs> <laughs> she, she had never been to Music that, that Row. They didn't come to my office. <laughs> she what didn't feel that? well enough by the time good. she left. I'm going to be well this weekend, though. You're not. She had never been to Music Row, and I was telling her about an interview I heard on the radio a couple weeks ago, and it's a um, country artist who had a new number one hit, and he was being interviewed, and someone said, well, you, you know, you've been number three. What's the big deal between number one, number two, or three? It's about the same amount of money. And he said, it's the banner. And I pointed out to Catherine these banners on Music Row that have your face if you have a number one hit. And she said, that banner from Kinko's? They look like they're $14.99. They're so. not that cheap. Uh, <laughs> that was one of my artists that said that. And he was being very transparent when he, when he said that. So anyway, the ban I think we all have our banner. I don't want yeah. to pick up on, uh, That's pick, a good point. Pick, up on, uh, pick on that artist. Yeah. We all have our banner. Good point. And so we've spent some time together over the last month with you all thinking about this topic and we've touched on a variety of things, but I'd love for you to share, are there any um, closing anecdotes or stories that you'd like to share with the crowd? Um, sometime when your faith has inspired you to make a countercultural decision, um, a time when you've faced something really tough in your work and um, your faith has been um, something that you turned to and you did something that maybe surprised people, or any other thing you might like to, to share um, before we have our intermission? I uh, do a lot of stuff that surprises people. <laughs> but I don't think that's what you're talking about. Um, um, I say a lot of things that surprise people too, but um, I think, um, you know, there's this wonderful little uh, book of Puritan prayers. Um, and I don't exactly know when the Puritans live, but it was a long time ago. And... Uh, uh, it's these beautiful prayers, and it's called the Valley of Vision, and uh, you ought to get it. Um, the Valley of Vision basically is, the title is based on the fact that uh, we are sort of um, brought up to believe that the best vision that we have, or the best view that we have, is when we're on the highest peak. And certainly geographically, that would generally be true. But in the practical matters of life, uh, many times the valley is where we have the best vision. And I think Bill described that beautifully as he shared his story. So um, I think the, the, when I'm on the, the mountaintop, kind of, um, it's kind of that control thing that kicks in and says, thank you, Lord, I got it from here a little bit. And, um, and then when I'm in the valleys is when I actually feel the closest um, to the Lord, and it's when I am forced to trust, and I say forced in the, in the best sense of the word. Again, just as Bill described it so beautifully. So um, it's a constant. I think 
uh, something that Bill alluded to earlier is true. We, we kind of all, if, if you've been around the church, in the church, if you're a believer, you study the word, we all know the truth about false idols in our lives, and we all, we all know the, the real truth. We all know where our real peace comes from. We all know where our only hope can lie. We, we all know that. We just have to be reminded, and not just every day, like a uh, I meet with a, two men's groups a week, um, Bible study groups, and, and I wish I'd do five a week uh, because every time I'm in there, I'm just reminded of the truths of where my joy, where my peace um, really lie. And, um, and so that's been kind of a, I'm not giving you a particular instance, I'm saying that there's not a week go, that goes by in the 30-some-odd years that I've been in the business that I've not seen that, that valley, um, you know, see the, have more vision in the valley than on the high places. Can you add on to that about um, how have you handled being an important person <laughs> and how do you how do you you have incredible uh as as a ceo any ceo has incredible power but in your particular industry you have more power than most to completely make or break someone's dream and how do you steward that well i prefer to think i helped make it when it works <laughs> and when it doesn't it was their fault but but I, but now we, 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 as I said, that you know the publisher just comes alongside. Uh, I have at least one songwriter here tonight that I love uh, very much, and I, my, I think that my job with with him is to uh, I have two here tonight at least. Uh, my job is to, as I said, come alongside uh, beside them. Um, as far as the important part goes, and this is not like false humility. I can do false humility, but this this isn't. Um, um, and I can make you believe it when I do it, but, but I'm not doing that right here. Uh, uh, I, I think power, I'm glad you used the word power because um, perceived power, at least, really um, is about influence. And so certainly Bill has a great influence over not only all of his employees, but all the people he comes in contact with in the space that he runs in, in his sphere of influence. He has great influence there. That's, that's really, I, I prefer to look at importance or power as simply influence. And so certainly we, we're in positions that get, allow us to have a greater sphere of influence than some of our best friends do. But they too are responsible for you know how they move and live in that sphere of influence and maybe there is a greater responsibility for us but that's how I, I um, power is a tough word I, I realize how we use it importance is tough I realize we use it but I, if we look at it as influence I think we can have a healthier view of ourselves and what we're called upon to do than if we think I'm a powerful person in an important role. And the last thing I'll say is uh, Jerry Bradley was my mentor for 15 years, still is really. And um, since 1988, he's been a great mentor. And he used to say, just remember one thing, son. And he said it much more crass than I'm about to say in front of you. He said, um, that chair you're sitting in, the power actually resides in the chair. Because one day they're going to come into that office and they're going to ask you to stand up and to leave. And you're going to think the power goes with you, but it don't. It stays in the chair, and that's where it belongs. And I thought, wow, there's a lot you could poke holes in on that, but there's a grain of truth uh, that, that is in there. And, and so uh, I try to keep that in mind. Influence. And so as your last thought, before I move back to you, Bill, if uh, a lot of people in here may say, well, you're the CEO. Of course it's easy to navigate all this as the CEO you get to do what you want what would you say to someone in the music industry who's at the beginning of their career who might be in this room and how um, any advice you can impart to them on how they navigate through the music industry and trying to integrate their faith uh, redundant now but love people pour yourself into people Live your life with open hands and open arms. There's nothing worse than trying to go through life that's more frustrating for you and everybody you make miserable if you sit around with your arms crossed all the time, not willing to be vulnerable. Get, 
should say get naked. You know, like, like get naked before people, you know, metaphorically. Uh, uh, be vulnerable. Be honest about it. You know, I, people have said to me about tonight, oh, that's going to that's gonna be tough, you know, for you to be like uh, transparent about this. No, it's, it's not. The more you do it, and country people are a little, it is a little easier for us <laughs> to be, I've got some, some guys from up north that uh, work for me and they keep everything close to the vest, but it's a little easier for us. But I'm telling you, it's freeing. People grow from it. They're influenced positively from it. So I would say our son's 22 years old. He just went to work at his first official full-time job. It's in the music business. And um, I'm grateful that you know, he grew up in it, and he wants to, to be in it. I'm grateful for that, but I'm f- afraid for him. And I constantly say to him, to the point that he's now kind of told me to stop saying it, um, I, um, first of all, he said, Dad, everything doesn't have to be a life lesson. Uh, as a good one. Uh, then he said, he has, I say this to him all the time, though, son, just remain humble and love people pour into people, invest into people, engage in the lives of the people that you come in contact with. You will live a fuller life. You'll be blessed, and those around you will be blessed. Stop worrying. And not that he is, but don't worry. Don't get caught up in this, this closed kind of thing. Is that okay? All right. Thank you. Bill, what about... What about you, Bill? How, um, tell us a tale that you want to end with. I don't really have a tale either uh, to end with. Uh, but um, I was, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of end with this thought. Um, I, was, I did the thing that we don't do very much, uh, but all think we should often when we get on an airplane. I sat next to this kid. He was about 24. I flew to Boston this weekend and so I was a couple of hours on a plane with he was stuck with me because I was in the mood to talk to him and he he um, actually he sort of started off we just had a little back and forth and he was just in a really pivotal time in his life he was fixing to move change jobs move across the country leave his family grew up in New Hampshire all his life small town and I I just was intrigued by this guy and I spent two hours talking to him about purpose and passion and he's not a believer and well he said uh, we started talking about and I expressed my faith and in a real, you know, kind of loving way, whatever. And then I said, now, tell me about your faith. And you don't need to feel nervous or anything. I don't care what it is. You can say whatever you want to. I'm not a religious guy here that's going to. And he kind of said, well, I've, I've been baptized. And, <laughs> and then he kept talking. And I realized that he probably wasn't really a believer. But it was a precious two hours. And... It ended up with me basically telling him that, yeah, church is not where it's uh, for me. That's not the answer either or the Bible either. Or I don't Because he was talking about his positive thinking instead of the Bible. That was what he really had moved toward. And I was like, you know, I don't really, it's not the Bible for me either or it's not the church. It's, it's uh, that, that I actually believe that I can, have a personal relationship with God that I can actually know this creator that I can have a relationship with him so I don't really I'm not I kind of was like I don't really church the Bible and all that those are things that just let me get closer to this person that I have a relationship with who really cares about my life and I hadn't shared my faith that way in a long time and here's this 25 year old kid who kind of bit on that and started um, it led to more dialogue so when I was sitting here thinking about my faith at work and my 35 years of trying to figure out how to refine this calling and to become more wise and more 
of a steward of what I have and to be more impactful and to have more influence for the kingdom. It's really, I love our workers. And it's, it, I just want to creatively think, how in the world can, I, can these people's lives be enhanced and ultimately led to the kingdom because of something we do here? And it can be hard because I... Uh, should we do this? Should we do that? Ethical dilemmas. Should we do, run our company this way? Should we, do, you know, all these questions about how we should live our lives as believers in the marketplace and what we should do to make that all work out. And it can be fretful. Except that, the, you know, I, if I will remember what I told that kid, which is that the goal of mine is to be really, really near to Jesus, to be really, really near to him and to wake up in the morning and to sit with him and to tell him how much I want to be the man that I want to be and that he can transform me and that I can't do any of this and that unless he does it and just make my goal to know him more then the rest of this stuff will work out and it'll be effective and people come to the kingdom and God will work and people will be drawn to him and I will make the right choices and I, I will do the right things and I will give up when I'm supposed to give up. It's when I don't, it's when it doesn't all boil down to that relationship when I'm in a really good relationship with him, the rest of it falls into place. And I'm 56, and maybe I'm finally figuring that out, but I'm, dest I'm determined to live my life in a way that goes, you know what, the main goal is not to figure out how to solve this problem or that one or do this all right. It'll all work out if I can pursue that one. Amen. So let's take a quick intermission, and that I'd love to have you back in your seats in about eight minutes. But the bar is open. You can find your way to the restroom, and a big round of applause for the vulnerability of Bill and Troy.